If you'll open your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter 7. Isaiah, chapter 7. This is during a time when Ahaz was the king of Israel. And there was a threat from the Syrian nation coming down to try to take over. And the prophet Isaiah was sent to him to make it known that God was going to keep and protect Israel. Beginning at verse 10. And the scripture says, Moreover, the Lord spoke to uh, Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord or your God, and ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz says, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And Isaiah said, Hear ye now, house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. And Isaiah speaking prophetically here, it had very little to do with what was actually going on at that time. But he's speaking something that would happen about 700 years later. That a virgin would conceive and she would bear a son and his name shall be called. And not as far as the literal name, but many times God used names to tell signs or to tell what people would actually be, what their character would actually be. And he said his name would be called Emmanuel, which interpreted is God is with us. As we now have come into this season of celebrating the birth of Jesus and where is we wait to have some water please. Celebrating the birth of Jesus there's a lot of things that people debate about. One of the main things being, was Jesus actually born on December 25th? Well, I say this, if the actual date was that important, then it would be listed in the scripture. I don't think he was born December 25th, but the thing about, I was at work one day, leaving work actually, and a young man, one of my fellow workers, came and asked me, James, just got a question for you. Do you celebrate Easter? I knew exactly where he was coming from. So I told him, well, it all depends, brother. If you're talking about bunny rabbits and eggs, and that kind of stuff. No, I don't celebrate that. But if you're talking about the resurrection of Jesus, I celebrate it 365 days a year. Amen. And he just said, oh, okay, and walked off. Well, it's the same thing about the birth of Jesus. Amen. No, we don't put up Christmas trees and we don't have the Santa Claus stuff and all like that, and I don't have anything to do with don't judge anybody who does but if you're talking about the birth of Jesus I celebrate that 365 days a year and 366 on leap year <laughs> so then in the book of Genesis chapter 1 And I guess if I'm using it, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Didn't, didn't notice it. All right. Thank you. Now I got much more. Good. In the book of Genesis chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. We go back to a long time ago. And it's, the book is speaking about the creation. 
And then when it gets to the sixth day of creation, verse 26, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over all the cattle and over all the earth and every, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and repent, plenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fowl of the sea and over the fowl of the, over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So after God had created the heavens and the earth and everything else, he created this man in his own image and likeness. Why did he create man? For fellowship with himself. All the other creatures were there and they had part in all, but there was no other one that was like God. God made man to be like him, to fellowship with him. But God knew before he ever created man, that man would fall. And he also knew what it would take to redeem man. All right? So, and you know, when we think about redemption, we often think about, you know, warriors, somebody that's going to fight the battle and redeem something that has been taken away. We think about warriors. We think about kings. We think about presidents. We think about sports heroes, <laughs> but God had something entirely different in mind. Amen. In fact, our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Revelation chapter 13, is declared to be the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. God already knew what it was going to take to redeem us and had already declared it. Now, if I can just, you know, take a sidestep here for a moment. My, my life was not always like it is today. And not even before, but even after I was saved. There came a time that I had become very discouraged about a lot of things. And even after I had been called into ministry, I did what we call backsliding. I backslid, okay? And I went back into the world, and you, have, you need to understand this. Uh, I wasn't always the handsome, masculine man that's before you right now. <laughs> no, when I was coming up, I was what was called a geek. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, as far as girlfriends and stuff like that, that was, didn't come to the latter part of my teenage years. And when, once I had gotten, I was called into ministry and things didn't go right, I went back into the world, moved, that's when I moved up to Michigan and all. And once I got up there, I could be anybody that I wanted to be because they didn't know me. They didn't know about my past and all. And so there came a time when, now I never did get completely out there doing drugs and all like that, but I was doing a lot of stuff that I knew I shouldn't have been doing. And at one time, I even had three girlfriends at the same time. And I thought, man, I was all that. But then something happened. One of them got pregnant. And Tyson was born. And a baby changed everything. Because when he was born, I knew then, I gotta stop this foolishness. I gotta get right with God. And I need to have someone that's going to be the kind of mother that he needs. Mm. 
And that was when I rededicated myself to God. Shortly after that, I met Kim. Nine months later, we were married. But a baby changed everything. Amen. And I know with some of you in your life, that can be the thing that happens. And then even when I turned my life back over to Jesus, I thought I was, it was going to take a while. I was going to have to get some things in line. I was going to have to do this and do that. But it's kind of like one of my favorite songs right now. I, when I turned from where I was going to turn, Jesus was right there. And I realized today from that song, it says, there was Jesus. Yep. <laughs> Everywhere that I had, everything I'd ever been through, there was never a time that he was not right there with me. Even though I wasn't recognizing him, he was there with me. So then, looking at this that we're celebrating the birth of Jesus, it's not like most of us think it was. In fact, let's look at Matthew chapter 1. And I know, and I thank God, some of this Pastor Roy went through last week setting the foundation, but and I was hoping he wasn't about to start preaching my message again this morning when he <laughs> started there. But um, Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus was on, Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Jacob, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now just right there. Here you have this young teenage girl engaged. And before she gets married and before they ever have a relationship together, she's found to be pregnant. Now just think about it, young ladies. You're engaged to someone, and you and your fiancé have never had sexual contact, and now you're pregnant, and you got to go and tell him that you're pregnant. That's not nearly as simple as when we read it as it might be. Okay? Because how do you explain it? Oh, well, I'm pregnant for God. <laughs> right. Okay, in verse 19, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Well, I mean, here you have, obviously he's a good man, because back then, in a situation like that, that woman's supposed to be stoned to death. That's right. Mm -hmm. But he, being a good man, said, no, he's just going to, you know, he's going to let it go, write it off put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So here you are once again in this situation and you have this dream. Now, of course, I know most of you men that are here if you had a dream like that, that would do it for you, right? Yeah. And, but Joseph did. Joseph accepted it. Somehow in the dream, it must have been one that was very convincing. And I know I've had a few dreams like that, that I know that was God speaking. Okay. And said, she shall bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Does that sound familiar? Which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, 
and knew her not till she brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, as I said, that, you know, as we just read through that, it seems light and easy, but you got to put yourself in that position. That had to be a really hard thing for her, for him, okay? But he submitted to the will, she first submitted to the will of God, and he submitted to the will of God, as all of us should do. Okay, so then, um, then in chapter, I mean, uh, let, let's jump to Luke chapter 2. And hold your place there in Matthew. We're going to come back to that. Luke chapter 2. And it says, And it came to pass in those days, that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee unto the city of Nazareth, in Ju out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, and into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David. to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. They were traveling. They had to come to Bethlehem which is where uh, Joseph was to be taxed. You gotta think about something. This woman is eight to nine months pregnant and she's got a ride from Nazareth to Bethlehem on a donkey. Hello, good people. <laughs> pregnant and having to ride on a donkey. They get there and the hotel is full. So they can't even rent a room. They've got to go to a barn. And there she delivers the baby. And you don't have any, you know, doctor's bed and all the stuff there. She has to put him in a trough that you feed cows in. Put a little hay in it and then lay the baby in it. Verse 8, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel of the Lord said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. And they have a baby blanket like many of them that you saw here on the picture just in the video just now. Swaddling clothes, that's graveyard clothes. That's the kind of clothes that you wrap people in when you're getting ready to bury them. That was what Jesus was wrapped in in his birth. And suddenly there was a, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, 
Let us now go even to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. So they come and they find it just like the angels had told them. But wait a minute. Who were these people that came? Shepherds. What were shepherds during that time? They were the lowest order of people that you could find. And they came and found Jesus. Now think about shepherds. They stayed out in the field with sheep for months, sometimes years at a time without coming back into town for anything other than to get food. And how long had they gone without bathing? What did they smell like? Yet angels came and appeared to them and told them that Jesus, the Son of God, has been born in Bethlehem. And they were invited to come and to witness his birth. The lowest ranking of people. All right? Back to Matthew. Chapter 2. Beginning at verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king, the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he de demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of you shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently at what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him. And when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, uh, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Okay, I'm going to mess up a few things here. First off, when we have our, you know, manger scenes and all, we basically have it where you have Joseph and Mary and ba the baby in the manger. And then you have uh, these three kings with their camels and all. And you have the shepherds all standing around. And I'm sorry to have to be the one to break the No, I'm not. But I'll, I'll just break the news to you. That's not exactly how it was. Because number one, nowhere does it say anything about three kings. It said wise men from the east. These were astrologers from the east. It never said three. It just said wise men. They came. And when they got there, Jesus was no longer in a manger. In fact, it says over and over as we read this, the little child. They had left and they were now in a house okay and these men that came I don't know how many it was but because they had they brought three gifts people assumed it was three of them we don't know how many of them it was all right but anyway they came and they asked of the king of King Herod uh, where was he to uh, uh, to be born and so 
Herod asked of them, when did that star appear? Now, they came, they had to come from somewhere in the Far East to Jerusalem. They didn't just hop on a 747 and fly over there. It took them approximately two years to get there. And so every time it refers to Jesus after that, look at what it says, verse 10, where after they left, to, uh, so it says, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented to him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And when they, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be, thou, and be there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Herod hears that this child is going to become the governor, the ruler. And, a, and so that means that his lineage would be cut off as kings. So he sends to find out where this young child is so that he can have him killed. And God warns them, don't go back and tell Herod that you found the child and where he was. So they went a different way. Okay, and so Joseph took, and of all places, and when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. <laughs> Here are Jews going to Egypt. Mm. And there he was until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, uh, spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. These things happening because God said this is how it's gonna happen. Whether it makes sense to us or not, God said this is how it's gonna happen and this is exactly how it happened. Verse 16, then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly angry and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So, but here is the point. You have these shepherds that came, the poorest of the poor that came, that were invited to come and see the Son of God. You also have these wise men, rich men from the East, some of the richest that are called to come and to see the Son of God that has been born. So what is the point? The point is that with God, everybody is welcome. It doesn't matter what you have or what you don't have. Everybody is welcome to come. And this thing is, even at this point, look at what already is happening. As the song said, a baby changes everything. Well, this baby changed everything. All right, a baby, it's so, how a baby can change your life and your world. A baby changed my world, but God sent a baby to change the entire Amen. world. Amen. So who was this baby <laughs> that came and changed everything? In John chapter one, the gospel of John. And why, and I know we hear these kind of stories almost every year and all, but the thing is, somewhere along the line, my brother, my sister, we've got to grasp the fact that this is not just some fairy tale. This is not some of the stories that we, you know, hear about different things that are going No, this is absolute truth. 
And when we grasp this truth, it can change our world even more so than babies that have come into our lives change our world. Because this not only changes the world, it changes everything. Ch chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Wow. <laughs> the Word was with God. Many of us Sad to say, our words are not with us. We say all kind of stuff that we don't actually believe. We say things sometimes just to get along with people or just to, call, to help people to like us. But you see, with God, it's different. His word is in to he is in total agreement. Everything that he says is absolute truth and he absolutely means it. Amen. He doesn't say things just to get along with us. <laughs> he means what he says. The word was with God and the word was God. Okay? And then an amazing thing. Verse 14. No, I'm sorry. Verse, if we, uh, verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, his own people that had been his, so he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become sons of God even to them that believe on his name. And that sons of God includes you ladies too. Children of God. He gave, those that believe, he gave the power to become children of God. All right? Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of man, but of the will of the, I mean, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. If you have accepted what was done, you are now born again of the Spirit of God. And look at this, verse 14. Now remember that word that was with God and that was God? Look at verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who was this baby? This baby was the word of God come in human form to dwell among us to be like us so that we could get what we hadn't. God had been trying to give us his word all along, but we couldn't quite get it. So his word became like us so that we could better understand what God was trying to get across to us. You see, this word, this baby that was born was actually the evidence of God's love for us, how much God loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Who was this baby? This baby was God's evident, the evidence of God's love for us. Who was this baby? When God made man, he used to come the scripture indicates in the cool of the day and fellowship with Adam and Eve. All right? But after they ate of that tree that he told them not of and they died spiritually, they no longer had that kind of fellowship. You know what? God missed it. It broke God's heart and he missed that kind of fellowship with man. He still could do it to a degree, fellowship, but it wasn't like it had been before the fall. And he wanted that because that was what he created us for, to have that kind of fellowship with him. So, this baby, a baby changes everything. 
This baby came to restore that fellowship with God that we had lost. This baby came to restore order to a totally chaotic world that had lost all of the, the purpose that God had created it for. He came to restore this world from the chaos. This baby came to give hope to the hopeless. And I know some of you are struggling here today, but Jesus came to give you hope that regardless of what it looks like, regardless of what it feels like right now, no, there is an answer. There is one who loves and cares for you more than you can ever even imagine. And there is one that has a purpose, that has a plan for your life, regardless of what it might be looking like right now. He came to give hope to a hopeless world and to the hopeless people of this world. Amen. He came to take back all that Adam had given away. He came to take it back that we might be restored to what God created us to be in the first place. This baby came to restore our relationship with God so that we not only <laughs> could walk with him in the cool of the evening, but that he could live in us and we could be in fellowship with him all day, all night, every day and every night. A baby changed everything. And I truly thank God today that he cared enough for me that he would send his son as a baby to experience as he grew up all things like I have experienced in life to know what it actually feels like. And that he, because he is in me and he has experienced all these things, regardless of what comes up, and he can give me hope. Yeah. So I say, brothers and sisters, today, if you will allow it, as was said earlier, not just as the baby anymore, but as the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Amen. Jesus has come to make the difference, whatever difference in your life that needs to be. If you will trust him, if you will believe him, he is here to make that difference. Amen. Amen. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for it's hard to imagine the love that you sent, that you, that you have shown, that you have given to us. Because, Lord, when I speak of the baby that changed my life. Lord, I, I, thank, I do thank you for Abraham, but he was willing to give up his son. And that's what opened the door for you to do the same. And Lord, I don't know. I mean, I, it would take an extra measure of grace for me to do the same. But I thank you, Lord, that you showed your love for me. You did it. And Father... I pray for anyone here today who has not accepted that gift that you have given, the greatest gift of all times. I pray, dear God, that every heart be open to receive and to experience all that you would have us to experience through your son that you gave. Lord, we give you glory. We give you praise. We give you honor now and forever in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.